All right, thank you, everybody. Thanks for the introduction. I appreciate that. It is six o'clock on a Wednesday before DEF CON. I'm surprised anybody is here. You all should be taking your naps while you have it. You all should be hydrating while you can. So thank you for sitting through this. Um, who here is familiar with software defined radio, even to a basic degree? Show of hands. All right, good. Good stuff. If I mess something up or if there's something better I could do, please come find me after and let me know. A lot of the stuff that I'm doing here, I'm trying to recreate with commercial off the shelf equipment that I would have used very expensive military equipment to do. So it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be one to one, but we're going to do our best. So what we're going to talk about essentially is just a very foundational introduction to SDR. For those who didn't raise your hand, this, this is more for you than anyone else. But for those who did raise your hands, this, this is going to be something where maybe I give you a slightly different idea about what you can use your SDRs for. Um, and we're going to focus on tactical things, which, you know, everyone likes tactical stuff, you know, but the reality is anything that's tactical in the world, you could translate to more mundane things. Just listening to the radio, if it's an FM broadcast, listening to your favorite song or whatever, well, you can mess with your SDR to listen to the local Chick-fil-A, which my local Chick-fil-A operates on FRS Channel 20. If they get my order wrong, I know before they do. But it's going to be more application than theory. If you're looking for theory, you know, I can Google that for you. you know, but the fact is, I'd rather show you how to do stuff. I don't know very many other talks that do live demos, but I'm going to try these live demos here. And hopefully, the live demo gods, which today is Poseidon, is going to favor me on this one. This is not going to be comprehensive, and I think we've already covered that. I have about 40 minutes worth of stuff. If I had an hour, two hours, maybe even three hours, we can get into some really heavy, nasty stuff. You know, but for now, we're just going to deal with some of the basics. I don't want it to be complicated either. I want this to be something you can go home and do yourself. If things get a little bit too complicated, I apologize. Again, I only have 40 minutes, but feel free to find me and I will walk you through it. We can spend as much time as you like. And also, and I mentioned this before, radio is, radio is not an exact science. It's fantastic and I love it, but it's going to mess with you when it can. Murphy's Law definitely applies here. So if my demos fail, I'm sorry, the demo failed, it happens. But hey, you know, it's a live demo. Things, things aren't always going to go right. A Little bit about me, I'm former Air Force. I just retired a few months ago. The stick up my butt is still taking its time to dissolve. But you know, eventually I will reach civilian life. I started to grow my hair out. That's cool, right? I'm still not embracing beard life. I don't know if I could do that yet. We'll see what happens. Um, but I was basically an intelligence analyst for a very long time. And when you're an intel analyst, you get into signals intelligence, human intelligence, um, instrumentation intelligence, all these things. Well, all of it is defined by signals. So it was inevitable that I was going to get into radio, both for defensive and offensive purposes, even if I wasn't specifically a radio guy. Um, the last five years of my career, I did special operations with uh, offensive and defensive cyber. And many of our enemies would converge their radio technology with cyber technology. So we were looking at a lot of digital mobile radio. We were looking at a lot of uh, digital modes for HF. We were looking at Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, all kinds of other IoT protocols that were sort of hijacked and used for tactical purposes. And that's where a lot of this is coming from. Um, also, yeah, I, um, I don't like long walks on a beach. I never have. Just not a beach guy. I've had enough sand in my life. Not going to do it. So software-defined radio, and I put here in a very, very small nutshell, but it's kind of impossible to do that. It's impossible to really define you know, SDR in just a few sentences. But essentially what you're looking at is if I pick up a radio like this, you'll know what this is. It's something that has a speaker. It has a bunch of numbers on it. It has a liquid crystal display. You can talk into it. You could hear other people talking back to you. A software-defined radio is all of this without the buttons, without the display, without the speakers, without the antenna, without anything that you would look at and think of as a radio. It's just a radio on a chip. Your computer is what's going to become all the buttons, all the displays, and all the speakers. So that's what's cool about a software-defined radio. It's versatile. You have one little thing, one little chipset that's going to take sounds, and it's going to modulate it, demodulate it from you know, whatever airwaves, electrons at whatever frequency, and then it's completely up to you and the applications that you're using on your computer to do something with that. And that makes it way more versatile than this. This is a one-trick pony. Transmit and receive, that's it. 
Software-defined radio, I can do all kinds of stuff, and we're just going to scratch the surface. We are going to use an RTL SDR. This is probably something like a $30 software-defined radio dongle. You can get it off of Amazon. Be careful, there are imitations out there. But if you go to rtlsdr.com, they will show you pictures of what a legit one looks like. And then you can pick it up and you can do all kinds of really neat stuff with it. They're receive only, but they have a pretty wide range that they can receive in. Um, obviously, it requires a computer interface because that's what we're doing. It's software-defined radio. But it's just a lot of fun and the barrier to entry to be able to use this and do all the cool things that we can do is really, really low. Next, we're going to use a HackRF. The HackRF obviously is way more expensive, but that's because it has a lot more features. It can send and receive, not just receive. Now, we're going to demonstrate that when, when I do some of my you know, neat sending techniques. But you can do a whole lot of really great stuff with the HackRF. It's just a matter of making sure you update the firmware and also making sure where you buy it from. You can get it off of a whole bunch of different sites where it's going to be drop shipped from wherever. Fine, as soon as you get it, make sure you flash the firmware, get the latest Mayhem firmware or something to make sure that it's legit. Uh, but if you get it from something like Great Scott Gadgets or you get it from Hack5 or something, it's already going to have everything flashed for you, but you're paying a premium for that. And then we're going to use the Flipper Zero. I bet none of you guys have ever heard of this. No, it's a brand new thing. I mean, I just kind of found it somewhere. Yeah, only I really know about it. <laughs> it's nuts. I'm, it's amazing I got through the airport with this stuff. Like all of these things. The Flipper Zero was the least of my worries. I was afraid somebody at TSA was going to recognize a hack RF and be like, sir, you can't bring that on the plane. No, nothing. They stared at my shoes more than they did at my bag, so I was lucky. So for software, what we're going to use is Windows 10. Windows is perfectly fine. It's a perfectly good platform for using the applications we want to use. Some people prefer Linux. I prefer Linux. But for those of you that are just getting into this, I would probably venture to guess that you may be Windows users. If you're a Linux user, great, good on you. Continue to be who you are. If you're a Windows user, you don't have to change. You don't have to become a Linux snob. You can do all this with Windows. Most of the stuff you can use on Linux, you can also use on a Mac because it's a Nix kind of system. So all the software that I'm going to be demonstrating today, you're probably going to be able to use on whatever kind of operating system that you like. We'll use SDR Angel. SDR Angel is freeware. It's open source. You can download it and you can install it. I'm going to show you how to set it up. Dump 1090 is another one that I like. This is how you pick up ADSB signals. This is not the same as aircraft transponder frequencies, but it's similar to it. And they call it Dump 1090 because you're picking up packets at 1090 megahertz and you're dumping it into an interface. Virtual radar server is the user interface that's going to manifest everything I collect from Dump 1090. And we're going to demonstrate that, hopefully. I use Momentum firmware on my Flipper Zero. I used to use Extreme, but they had some politics, and Extreme firmware is now defunct, so I use Momentum. Other people might use something else. That's fine. Everything we're doing will even work with the stock firmware. So don't worry about trying to copy what I got if you don't want to go through that pain. And for the HackRF, what I'm using is version 2023.01 Mayhem firmware. You can get later versions if you want to. Everything that I've done, I've done with this version, and I feel like if I flash it and upgrade it, it would break everything. So for now, I'm sticking with this. It doesn't mean follow my lead and downgrade everything. Yes, definitely patch, use the latest firmware, but this is what works for me now. So the first thing I want to demo is how to set up SDR Angel. I would do it live, but instead I made this recording, and I'm just going to follow the recording. So when you open it, you get this blank interface, but the first thing you do is you go to these icons that are up in the upper left, and you pick your receiver. My receiver is an RTL SDR. As soon as you have that manifested, you go to your add-ons. If you want to listen to regular FM broadcast, you can pick a uh, wideband FM demodulator. If you want to listen to things in the IoT space or sub gigahertz, you pick a narrow band FM demodulator. You want to listen to pagers, you can pick the POXAG demodulator. You want to listen to telegraphy, you can pick a demodulator for that. It's pretty cool. You have a whole lot of different options. Next thing you do is pick a transmitter if you have a transmitter. I'm picking the Hack RF, and now that I have the Hack RF, I need to know, well, what am I going to transmit? In this case, I'm transmitting narrowband FM because I'm going to be transmitting in the 400 megahertz space, so that's what I'm picking. So I went from a blank screen to this really pretty, cool-looking thing. It took me, I'm not going to lie, probably a good month and a half to learn how to use this program because it is not intuitive. There are 
more intuitive applications out there for software-defined radio, but this one I like because I can have a receiver and a transmitter at the same time. And a lot of the stuff we're gonna do is going to require that. And so this is the finished product. This is what it's going to look like. And if you can follow my mouse up here, you're going to see what the frequencies look like. You're gonna see like the histogram. Down here, you're gonna see something called a waterfall. It's gonna be a bunch of blue color that's gonna be coming down. And then you'll see some red, some orange, some yellow, maybe some green. The brighter and hotter the color, then the higher the uh, amplitude of the frequency that you're seeing or the power of the frequency. And so if you record that stuff, and this is something that we used to do, we used to send an SDR out on a plane into the middle of nowhere where we thought the adversaries were operating. We would set it up and we would have it run and we would have it record something exactly like this, playing with the waterfall. And then when we were finished, we'd retrieve those data and then somebody would take that waterfall that you're gonna see and they would put it on like 50 times play speed, 100 times play speed, and they would identify those hotspots, those changes in color, and they would correlate that with the frequency. And then we'd be able to analyze the frequency to see what is going on in that space. We call that electronic preparation of the battle space, IPB. When those data come to me, then I take a look at the frequencies and I try to check all the reporting to see who's operating or what's operating. Now I'm doing intelligence preparation of the battle space, IPB. So it all goes in hand and it all starts with being able to collect radio. I am doing this so far with nothing but my Windows computer and freeware. All right. So moving right along, the first demo is going to be me using a radio. Now I have a picture here of a Baofeng UV82. That's not what this is. This is, um, this is a UV9, but it's an upgraded one. Similar characteristics. It's still going to be basically a radio on a chip inside of a radio housing. You know, but for a very simple demonstration, we're going to start to receive signals and I'm going to key this and you'll see what it looks like when an SDR receives a signal. So let's get started. All right, we'll leave this. I will open up SDR Angel and you see when I open it up, it's going to come up in the configuration that I had already demoed for you. It takes a second. It's a pretty sophisticated piece of software, even though it's free, which is really nice. All right, here we go. You can all see this screen, right? All right, fantastic. Now I have my RTL SDR. It's receiving. I have it set to 433.920 megahertz. So you can see the waterfall down here. You see that blue space? You can calibrate that so it can be bluer, greener, whatever you want. But now I'm gonna key on that frequency that I have the SDR set to, 433.920 megahertz. And there you go. It's not a clean transmission. You have the peak at the frequency that I have set, but you have a lot of spurious transmissions to either side. That's because these are not very sophisticated radios, but they still do the job. That being the case, if you have audio, then you can actually hear when someone speaks into your radio because your SDR is going to receive it. Check, check here, check. Maybe you heard that, maybe you didn't. Check, 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 check. Okay, it is, out of that speaker, all right. Okay, well if you heard it, then success. You are now able to listen to Chick-fil-A. So that is the most basic advantage of having a software defined radio is, you know, with a little tiny dongle that looks like this. If you're far away, you won't be able to see it and I'm ruining everything. But with this little tiny thing, I'm able to pick up signals everywhere in the spectrum. If I want to pick up HF, high frequency is like, um, you're looking at like 50 megahertz, something like maybe 30 megahertz, all the way down to 12, 10 megahertz. When you're using a software defined radio to pick up signals like that, you need something called an up converter. You're taking that signal, you're converting it up into VHF space where it's gonna be able, it's gonna be human audible. So you can do something like that. You can get a down converter if you wanted to pick up something in very high frequency like satellite or microwave transmissions. And then you can do the same thing. You down convert it to something that would be able to be human readable, something that the software defined radio is able to demodulate. And it's pretty good stuff. Yes? It is additional hardware, and that's a really good question. So you can take that hardware, an up converter or a down converter is similar in profile to the SDR dongle. It's about the same size. Maybe they're a little bit smaller. Maybe they're a little bit bigger, depending on how much power you want behind it. 
but you do the same thing that you would like connecting an antenna. You know, you take an SMA cable or some kind of coaxial cable, you connect the down converter to the SDR dongle, then you connect your antenna to the down converter and you're creating a radio chain. So you could do it with software too, but the hardware is a lot better because, you know, with the software, it could be finicky and you have to really know how to use it. Whereas with the hardware, the software is already defined inside of that hardware. The work is already done for you. Nope. That's what we got. Now, because it's going to interfere with the next demo, I'm going to close this down and I'm going to restart. Now, remember I mentioned ADSB signals. Typically, I would use an RTL SDR receiver, but you can use whatever receiver. I'm using Dump 1090, which I already explained, and I'll demo that. Virtual Radar Server is a software that is going to give you a user interface and a map that'll show you visually, graphically, what the, dump, what the uh, Dump 1090 data looks like. Usually, I would use a dedicated 1090 megahertz ADSB antenna, which is pictured here. It was big to pack, so I didn't pack it. So instead, I am using this very small sub gigahertz dipole antenna, which does the, do the job almost as well as this big old ADSB antenna. And this can also pick up a whole lot of other cool stuff. I typically use this as a uh, GPIO attachment with the Hack RF, but it works just fine with your software defined radio too. So this dipole is what I'm gonna use to pick up these signals. So let's see what we can pick up. Because of the amount of material that is between us and the sky, this may be a complete failure or may not, but we're gonna try it out. All right, this is dump 1090. If I reposition the antenna, I start picking up some signals. If you look in the column that says alt, that's altitude. I'm picking up something that's grounded, but is still putting out some signal. And I'm picking up something that's at 46, 75 feet. You're picking up lat long for location, speed, heading, all kinds of cool stuff. That's all great and everything. But instead, let's see it on a map. And because this is a super professional talk, I have to hold the antenna up. Now, if I were picking up anything and a virtual radar server were picking it up too, then I would see it here. And I can zoom in on it. And this is what we got. So far, we have these two aircraft. One of these is American Airlines. It's a Boeing 737. You can see the altitude. You can see the speed. You could even see its flight plan. Phoenix, Las Vegas, and Phoenix, and back again. Let's pick this one. What does it look like? It's a Southwest flight, another 737. It's not transmitting a call sign, it's not giving a route, but that's okay, you can probably guess where it's gonna go. Typically things go to either McCarran or the various Air Force bases that are around here, like Nellis for instance. But it's not a very good demo because I don't have a lot of dense collection because of the antenna and because of the structure I have here. 1090 megahertz is a really high frequency and it's gonna get soaked up by nearly anything that this place is made of, specifically um, all the non-conducting stuff, it's gonna soak up your RF. The conducting stuff is probably going to take it and retransmit it. If I were to hook up a coaxial cable to any of like the I beams in here, then maybe I'd even use those and turn those into an antenna. I'm not gonna do that. Remember, 40 minutes. But you can do stuff like that. And so that's a demonstration of what ADSB can do. Free, open source. I still spent just maybe 60 bucks on the RTL SDR and that antenna. This is the kind of stuff that people use to generate worldwide intelligence. All over the globe, there are people that collect this stuff, they put it on a server, and you can go and you can view it from anywhere in the world. Hugely good intelligence gathering source. So it's another way that you can use passive radio collection for intelligence. Let's get rid of this. Let's get the show back on the road. This is a demo of what I took with a little bit more ideal conditions. You can see, you can see a lot more stuff. Um, there are things that are flying around that are like coming in northbound, eastbound, whatever. If you have more computing power and you have the proper antenna, you can see the movements of these aircraft almost in real time, which is nice. But using the antenna that I had, I can only see it updating every few seconds. But there you go. That's what ADSB looks like. And since we were able to do a live demo, I'm not going to show you the entire video. I'm not going to subject you to that. But we can move on. And like I said, you can use other people's stuff for this. 
So I use an SDR to pick up my radio signals. Well, you can go to shortwave radio receiver maps and you can pick up shortwave from receivers all over the world. Same thing with web, web SDR. People that have these things set up and they have all the collected data go to a server, you can go to their site and you can listen all over the world. You all know what's going on in Radio Free Cuba? There's a website for that. Somebody is collecting, probably in Miami, maybe Key West. You all know what's going on in Ukraine? There are people all over Moldova that are collecting the same stuff. ADSB Exchange is a good one too. You want to track grandma's flight when she's coming to visit? You can go to ADSB Exchange and you can see the flight as it is going along its flight path. That's how good the coverage is for the continental United States. So, you know, way better than having to go to the Delta app or something like that, at least in my opinion. But other than using other people's stuff, let's get into some real groovy things. So sub gigahertz, this basically means everything that is from a gigahertz down. When you start getting into broadcast FM around 108 megahertz down to maybe 75 megahertz, that's no longer technically sub gigahertz. Now you're getting into broadcast FM and then you get into HF. Sub gigahertz would be your IoT stuff, your garage door openers, your key fobs. Um, your SCADA systems, things like that, between 315 and 433 megahertz in the United States, 915 megahertz for lower WAN and um, different IACS networks. That's what you're talking about with sub gigahertz. Um, it's everywhere. If you do a frequency analysis of your house, you'll start picking stuff up and be like, what is this? It could be anything. It could be the tire pressure sensor monitors on your car. It could be various remote controls. It can be some smart device you didn't even know you had that's generating signals to something else. It could be anything. Um, it's scary. It could be your neighbor's alarm system and you're picking up those packets. Don't get any ideas, but if you do get ideas, it's a lot of fun. So that being said, be careful with this stuff. I'm going to demonstrate a few things where if we're doing it in this condition at this power, it's not really going to make too much of a difference. But if you start increasing power and you start targeting things you're not supposed to target, they will come get you. Maybe the FCC is not going to come get you specifically, but there are people all around that do stuff like fox hunt. If you interfere with their signals or you break their stuff and you transmit a signal continuously, they will triangulate you. They will find you. They will report you. And it may not be the FCC if you're interfering with government, federal or state level equipment. It may be the FBI. So just be careful when you're dealing with these things. Let's talk about signal analysis. There's a way that you do this. If you pick up a key fob or a remote control, anything that's supposed to have some kind of capability to transmit, it'll have an FCC ID. You can look this up on the FCC's website. When you look up that ID, you'll find the operating frequency. You'll find a whole bunch of different engineering and technical information about it. Um, you can do a lot of this stuff yourself. If the FCC ID isn't giving you what you need, you can use some equipment like what I showed you to demodulate a signal and you can figure it out. Well, what is this? Is this digital mobile radio? Is this a satellite signal? Is this encrypted or is it just, you know, coded, encoded into something? You know, is it video? Is it audio? Is it Morse code? You know, it's demodulation is, it's a crapshoot. But eventually you learn to look at that waterfall and you can identify what the signal is just by what it looks like visually. Sometimes it's a lot simpler than that. You look at something, it's a big, fat, red and yellow bit inside of, your, uh, inside of your waterfall. You go and you point to it and you start hearing people talking. Okay, I know what that is. It's audio. You know, sometimes it is that simple. Other times it could be some weird protocol that no one's ever heard of that's proprietary. And then you got your work cut out for you. I decided to start with these alarms. They're available on Amazon. They're very cheap. I bought a bunch of them because I like to install them on cabinets or doors or whatever if I'm traveling somewhere and I'm going to be away, but I want to have some kind of like an audio deterrent for robbers. I'll put this on a door, like a hotel door, whatever. If the magnets of this unit get more than a centimeter apart, it'll be loud. It'll be as loud as this. I have this inside of a Pelican case. If I took it out, it would be so loud that everybody would hear it. It's pretty good deterrent. I like it. Um, I got this and I'm like, you know what, let's play with it. Let's try to figure out what's going on. It has no encryption. It's got no rolling codes. It's nothing. I can play around with this and I could do all kinds of really neat demos, right? Now, as soon as I opened it up, all I found was what I expected to find from something that is mass produced and drop shipped. 
No FCC ID, nothing. I had nothing to go on. So I had to go and I had to manually get a spectrum analyzer, something like this. And I had to keep on pushing this button, keep on pushing it, keep on pushing it, and keep on looking at my waterfall to see when the heat map was going to change. And so I eventually did that and I used a flipper zero to do it. So now we're going to demo a signal replay. Signal replays are pretty good. Normally I would do this live. I still actually might do this live. I don't know. But essentially what you're doing is, and this is QFlipper. QFlipper is a, a, a graphic user interface that you can use for your Flipper Zero. I'm using the stock sub gigahertz, or actually in this case it's momentum, but it's the same as a stock. You can go to read raw, and if you program in the frequencies correctly, you can play that frequency and you could record it. So that's what I'm doing over here. Now I'm going to stop it there because now you know what the basics are, but I would rather demo it for you because I think that's way better. So here we go, this is me live. Going into start, going into sub gigahertz. And now I'm gonna read a raw signal. This is that signal. This is gonna be the unlock code for that alarm. Everybody hears that? I'm gonna read it. Why isn't, there it goes. There you go, there it is picking it up. I'm gonna move it a little bit closer. It's picking it up even better. I'm gonna move it far away. And it's picking it up about the same. But that's basically it. Now I'm replaying it. Flipper Zero was able to record it, no sweat, and then replay it. That's how much no encryption and no encoding this thing has. So it's a whole lot of fun to play with. Now moving right along, some of you are probably already thinking this, but if you can record a signal and play it back, then can you possibly DOS a signal like that? And the answer is yes. I'll let your mind run wild with the tactical implications of something like this, but while it's running wild, we're gonna do a demo. So, I'm gonna go back to SDR Angel, I'm gonna turn it on. Now, I am going to use my HackRF the Flipper Zero, and the SDR Angel. And my target device is gonna be this same alarm. So as soon as I get this started, I'm gonna play the RTL SDR. Here, sometimes it's gotta be refreshed, so I'm gonna do that. All right, refresh, all right, here you go. Play that signal. It resets to 435. That's why you didn't see anything. Let's get that back. 433.92. There it is. God, that's an ugly signal. But anyway, now I'm going to generate that same signal with my Hack RF. I'm going to show you just how little power it takes to disable an alarm like this. Why would you want to disable an alarm like this? I, I don't know. I'm not going to say it. Don't make me say it. There you go. Now you see the signal. You see that it's a little bit off. That's because radio is not an exact science, but we're still going to work with it anyway. Now I am generating that signal. So if I play this, the signal is not strong enough to interfere. So you still hear it. But what if I amplified it a little bit? That's not working either. What if I gave it a little bit more horsepower? Uh-oh. Let's dial that down just a little bit. You can still see the signal from the key fob, or the uh, alarm fob, but it's just not reaching the unit. Dumb it down a little more, a little more. There we go, so we kind of found our power threshold. I can sit here and like have you guys give me wild guesses on how this could be useful to an adversary. You know, let's say that I wanted to disable transmission capabilities for key fobs for a parking lot for a U.S. embassy somewhere. Or maybe the U.S. does that to a foreign adversary embassy. Maybe there's critical infrastructure somewhere that we want to disable. Maybe there's a communications network we want to disable. This is jamming. This is denial of service. And this is how we do it. I was just able to disable an alarm. It took a little bit of work, but I did it. Not every alarm is that unsophisticated, but with the right know-how, you can do the same exact thing. All right, let's stop these because somebody somewhere is 
having trouble with their pacemaker, and I don't want to. I don't want any of that shade on me. So I'm going to demonstrate this now with a car. Modern cars, maybe not, because some of them are. Uh, some of them use frequency hopping, but old cars, most definitely. So this is me doing the same exact thing, and I'm disabling the capability of me being able to unlock this Tacoma. So you see the lights are going, and you see the waterfall is registering. You can see the signal over there. Now, as soon as I turn that signal up, so I generate the, uh, the DOS signal from the HackRF. And then you can see that I'm uh, turning up the power just a little bit. And now I'm pushing the button, and you see no lights, nothing. Nothing is happening. I just DOS the car. I DOS that key fob. Really unsophisticated kind of attack. But it's something that you can do in somebody's driveway to mess with them. Yeah, haha, -ha, funny. Don't do it to a cop. Don't do it to the local sheriff. Ask me how I know. But yeah, that's basically it. So now that we've, now that we've seen what a Flipper Zero, what an RTL SDR can do, what a HackRF can do, there are a lot more possibilities. If I wanted to have wide band spectrum analysis because I was doing some EPB or I was doing some IPB, I can get something like a tiny SA Ultra which gives me a much wider field, a much wider waterfall than any of this software would be able to do, then I would be able to like take from like say 300 megahertz up to 800 megahertz and just look at that and see where the spikes are and then I'd be able to drill down. If I want to do direction finding, I, there's an SDR for that. The Kraken SDR has anywhere between, depending on the model, anywhere between five and six different antenna ports. And if you position these antennas all along a line and you receive a signal, then you can basically direction find via, you know, for your eyes it'd be parallax, but via antennas it's triangulation where the signal source is coming from. Professionals use this to, to find signals. It's right there. You can buy one. If I wanted to simulate a cell phone station somewhere, who would want to do that? I can use Blade RF. You can go to GitHub and you can get the software. It's, it's as easy as that. It takes a couple hundred dollars. If I wanted to spoof GPS signals, let's say that grandma's plane finally landed. She rented a car and now she's driving to your house. Let's say you're not happy about that. You can set up a Lime SDR or a Hack RF on the side of the highway with the right software and the right amount of power, spoof GPS to make grandma think she's in Thailand and you've just bought yourself another hour. So, what? <laughs> I consider Wi-Fi to be one of those cool software-defined radio targets that everyone overlooks because there are much better things you can do to mess with Wi-Fi. But well, what I have on the desk over here, you can definitely mess with Wi-Fi. Who here has ever messed with Wi-Fi with a Flipper Zero? Oh, a few people. Okay, this is what we're going to do. With a Flipper Zero that has a Wi-Fi dev board, and I, I couldn't live demo this because then I'd interfere with the facility's Wi-Fi, but you can set this up with a GPIO board that contains you know, the right kind of software to demodulate 2.4 gigahertz. You can set up your own little test router, and if you have a mobile phone that you can use to be the victim, then you can do your own deauthentication attack. This is how I did that in video form with a Flipper Zero. You go to your GPIO settings, and you go to your uh, ESP32 board. I'm using Wi-Fi Marauder, so I'm picking that. And then the first thing you do is you scan for the access points. You collect all those access points, you stop the collection, and then the next thing you want to do is go and list which access points you collected. Give it a couple of seconds, you'll soak up however many happen to be in your area. So here, I found one that I want to mess with. I'm going down to list AP, and which one is, oh, it's a trap, that looks good. That's selection number one. So maybe I'll pick that one. So I go back and I select my AP. I am selecting number one. And then I hit save, and then I go back. So now I have my target access point. Next thing that I want to do is send deauth packets. But before you can send a deauth packet, you have to start collecting those packets. Or you'll send deauth, and you're just not collecting anything. If you're not collecting anything, then a deauth packet's not going to give you um, any of the encrypted credentials that you're looking to crack. So first, you have to go to sniff, and then I go to sniff raw. This, this allows me to get everything, not just a deauth packet, because it's a little bit finicky if you try to go a little bit too specific. Now that I'm sniffing, I send my deauth packets, stop the deauth, 
And now that I'm collecting, I'm getting the deauth packets. And then if the uh, endpoints on this router have uh, a setting to reconnect to the access point, then as soon as I deauth it, then it's going to want to come back. When it comes back, I can collect my four-way handshake. Now I've done that. There's my file. So I'm going to take my file. I'm going to download it onto my desktop. And then, bam, I can do whatever I want with it. I can analyze it with Wireshark. I can possibly open up Kali Linux and do whatever I want with it. But this is what it looks like right here. This is, this is what I did. This is what I did with this Flipper Zero that the airport just kind of let me through with. So it's pretty badass. I like it. So what can you do with something like that? Well, now that you have that packet, you can analyze it to see if you got those four-way handshakes. They're called EAPOL packets, so Extensible Authentication Protocol over LAN. These packets are what's going to contain your encrypted password. And whenever you're trying to crack Wi-Fi, this is what you're looking for. I would crack it. I would say that's beyond our scope. But I feel like we have a few minutes to do that, so let's do it. So again, couldn't do it live. But this is just me demonstrating how to do it on Kali Linux. This is how I'm using that, um, that PCAP file that I just got. I am going to use all the stock stuff that you would find on Kali. I'm going to use a modified rockyou.txt file that has all these passwords on it. We're going to do the crack. You're going to see it happen. And while it's happening, um, I can explain some other cool things you can do with SDR. Actually, I'll explain one other cool thing you could do with SDR. With the right kind of antenna, and in this case, it would be like a helix antenna, you could pick up satellite signals. I was able to pick up the International Space Station while they were sending down recorded video. And with, a, with an RTL SDR and an antenna that looked kind of like a double helix, I picked up that signal and I was able to use the right kind of software to demodulate it. And then I got that full motion video and I was able to show it to a group of high school kids. They were like, wow, this is awesome. I was afraid that they were going to say, nah, if you can do that, what else can you do? Because then they would come to this talk, they would see all this other crap. You don't want high schoolers running around with a hack RF. It's, it's just not advised. You know, and here, we cracked the password. There it is. So it's a trap is Veritas1. Now I got to go change my password on everything. So that's it. We did a little bit of passive capture using a radio. We did a little bit of active capture for offense. You know, and that's, you know, listening into Chick-fil-A or recording signals and replaying it because electronics equals intelligence in my book. We did some active emission for defense. In this case, you are looking at um, jamming signals that might be offensive in, in nature. Like, say you have an adversary team that's moving in. You jam their radio, their comms are down. If they depend on their radio, they don't know how to use hand signals, they're done. You got the upper hand. And we use some active emission for offense, which is cracking a password. So just really simple things that we can do with commercial off-the-shelf stuff. And we ran the gamut of what a military team would need if they were on the ground. So this is my question slide. Now I'm going to make it big. I dare you guys to do a QR code scan. I dare you. Questions? So you mentioned picking up the ISS with the SDR. There are instructions. You can build a V-dipole with coat hangers. And it, it's not great, but it works. So someone's on a budget. Yeah, no, that's, that's a really good thing. It's, I've built antennas out of Christmas lights, out of coat hangers, whatever. If it's metal and it resonates and it's cut to the right size, the answer is yes. You definitely can do that. The thing about satellites is that if you're on the ground, you can see what an antenna is doing. You can see how it's facing. This is a vertically polarized antenna. This would be a horizontally polarized antenna. For you to get the maximum gain when you're receiving or sending, you want to match the polarization. Satellites are too far away to see where their antennas are pointing. So if you do use a coat hanger, you still want to try to make it a spiral or a helix. So when you're pointing it at like whatever is transmitting, you have a whole bunch of different parts of your antenna that are going to, at some point, match the polarization of the antenna of the satellite. That's why you'd want to use a helix. Other questions? Yes, sir. Well, what's the uh, cost on the um, spectrum analyzer, and do you have a recommendation for a make model? Um, I lost my hearing in the war. Can you repeat that a little louder? I'm saying, hang on. 
So, sorry about that. No, no worries. Do, do you have a recommendation for the spectrum analyzer and what's the cost on that? Okay. So my, recommend, my recommendation, if you're serious, is the Tiny SA Ultra. And that's something that I, that I had on the uh, you know, nice to have slide. You're looking at maybe between $150 and $180 to buy one. It's really small. It's a small screen, which sucks. But if you have good eyesight or if you're able to use a magnifying glass, you can see some good detail. But that's okay because all you're looking for is where a spike is and then you can zoom in on that and you can demodulate from there or you can at least see what the signal looks like you can see the frequency and then you can get more sophisticated equipment to pick up that frequency that's what i would recommend if for nothing else then the tiny sa ultra is able to collect on an extremely wide band so you can collect on anything from 10 kilohertz up to one gigahertz you'll see a ton of things but you can do that if you're less serious about it, a Flipper Zero has a frequency analyzer and a spectrum analyzer can, that can do the same thing. If you're even less serious, this RTL SDR, and I can unplug it now, my demos are over. This RTL SDR with any antenna, the antennas that come with it, you know, which are just telescoping aerial antennas like rabbit ears or something like this and the right kind of software, whether it's SDR Sharp or um, GNU radio or SDR angel like I was using, you can do the same exact thing. You can read those frequencies. It's just a matter of what kind of like nice to haves you want, you know, but going from most expensive to least, least expensive, tiny SA ultra, the flipper zero and things like that. And then RTL SDR. Does that answer your question? Cool. Yes, sir. You. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Great presentation. Uh, I had a question regarding the Wi-Fi uh, attack. Yes. Two questions. One is, how do you detect it? And I assume it might be logs. But then the second is, how do you defend against it? Are there any options to defend? So, yeah, unfortunately, radio is inherently indefensible. It's not like a wired network. You know, there's no firewall for, for over-the-air signals. Um, so the way that I would detect it, if I had a Flipper Zero with a GPIO board, like an ESP32 chip, it would just be doing how I demoed it. I would go to um, AP scan, and I would just scan all the access points. And then from there, because the Flipper Zero, like the screen is so little, I would take that and I would dump that file, you know, because it's gonna record a SNF file. I would dump that onto my desktop and then I would open it up with Wireshark or some other um, packet analyzer. And that's what, I, that's what I would look for. If I didn't have a Flipper and I had something like a HackRF, if I were using like the right antenna, like an alpha card or something, then I can use a hack RF, I can use an alpha card and I could record that way. If I had just a laptop and an alpha card, then I can use something like Kismet or even just Aircrack NG, that suite, and I can detect APs that way. There are so many different ways to do it. It really just depends on what kind of antenna you're using because radio is finicky like that. I can't use a sub gigahertz antenna for something that's over one gigahertz. It, it won't pick it up the right way. But that's, those are the methods that I would use. For defense, your best defense is to make sure that your security is on point. The way that I was able to collect packets and deauth them and then get the EA poll packets and then crack the password was because the security on that was WPA2 and the password was weak. If you're using WPA2, make sure that your passcode, your passphrase, your password is long, it's complicated, not something I'd find in a dictionary and it's something that you'd be able to remember because if someone keeps on forgetting the password, they're going to browbeat you into making it simple. You know, don't listen to grandma, listen to the security. Um, another good one is WPA3. If you don't use WPA3 on your access points, use it now. WPA3, WPA3 that protocol, that security uh, protocol, that standard, transmits four-way handshakes that contain encrypted passwords as a completely encrypted packet. So Wireshark or whatever wouldn't be able to see that it's an EA poll packet. I wouldn't know which packets to try to decrypt. That's a cool thing about that. There are attacks that would downgrade that, like the Dragon Blood attack, and it's basically just like an evil twin attack, you know, where you pretend to be the same access point and you make people log on to you, and then suddenly you're using WPA2 when you start capturing everything. You know, look it up. It's a really cool, uh, it's a really cool technique. Um, but from what I was doing, without doing anything more special, WPA3 would defeat that. And a long, complicated, unique, not in a dictionary password would defeat that too. Other questions? All right, nothing seen. Thank you so much, you guys. I really appreciate it. <laughs>